We've occasionally talked about what it might be like to be the last sentient life standing at the end of time and looking back at your once glorious civilization, but what if we spin the time dial even further ahead in time, set it all the way past the end of eternity until that last person could not even remember their past civilization? It's been a year since we did the first episode of the Civilizations at the End of Time series, Black Hole Farming. To my surprise, that episode went on to become the most watched one on the channel, so it seems like it deserves a sequel. It probably shouldn't have been too surprising since the End of Time and Civilization is something upon which we ponder and speculate quite a lot. It is also the conceptual center of numerous stories both in and out of science fiction. The best of these, in my opinion, is the short story The Last Question by the Grand Master of Science Fiction, Isaac Asimov. Since this episode is sponsored by Audible and is our first occasion working with them, we'll spend a little time discussing Asimov near the end, and try to keep it spoiler free because you can pick up The Last Question by using my link, audible.com slash Isaac, or click on the link in the description below that gets you a free audiobook and a 30 day free trial of Audible. The problem with doing a sequel to a video about the end of time is there is not really supposed to be a sequel unless you have a time machine. As I said in that discussion, there are things we could do to keep life going even after the Black Hole era, but to do that we should first recap some of what we've already discussed last time, then introduce concepts like Boltzmann Brains and the Margulow's Levantine Limits on quantum computing and reversible computing. We also need to discuss quantum tunneling, proton decay, ion stars, and the fate of the Universe itself. We'll try to keep the technical aspects to a minimum, but they are there and this is going to be a fairly long episode, so as always, it might not be a bad idea to grab a drink and a snack before we start. To recap what we explored in the original episode, a black hole can be tapped for energy in three principal ways. The first and easiest is to drop mass into the thing and capture its kinetic energy as it plummets, like attaching a rock to a string wrapped around a generator and tossing the rock off the side of a building. The second is to use its rotational energy like a big dynamo, slowing down its spin in exchange for electricity. The third method is to tap into the Hawking radiation they are believed to emit. For very small black holes, there is actually a much higher amount emitted at a given time than from bigger ones. Any black hole gives off a large chunk of its mass energy as Hawking radiation, but while the big ones have more overall, double the mass, double the energy, they give it off far more slowly. If you double the mass, you also quarter the energy it gives off for any given time period. The amount of power is also constantly rising since in the absence of sufficient new material upon which to feed, the black hole's mass shrinks and smaller black holes give off more power. In an ideal scenario, you would make your own black hole with the power generation rate you wanted and just keep feeding it matter to maintain it at the same level of mass. You could make one that masses about a billion tons, gives off a billion watts of power, a gigawatt, and lives for about a trillion years, giving off that amount of power the whole time. Ideally you could feed matter into such a black hole indefinitely, replacing whatever was burnt off. That's roughly the power output of our bigger nuclear and hydroelectric plants, and you'd only need to feed it about a kilogram of matter per year to keep it going indefinitely. Indefinitely is a theoretically incorrect term in this context, however, because the entire galaxy masses out somewhere near 10 to the 42nd kilograms, enough to feed such a black hole generator for a million, 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 million years not bad considering humanity's basically been around for a million years, and we will start running out of natural starlight in the universe in a few million million years. Yet a naturally occurring black hole lives even longer than that, and does so by trickling its power out far more slowly. We discussed harnessing power from such behemoths in the original episode, by dropping matter into them or tapping their rotational energy, but this won't let you get all of their energy. 
Whereas a smaller black hole evaporates via Hawking radiation quite quickly, naturally occurring ones do so at such a slow rate that it could take eons to gather enough power to flip a single switch. Once you've exhausted all of its rotational energy, which is enormous, and dropped in every last bit of spare matter you have, all that's left is that Hawking radiation. However, running an entire civilization on levels of power that you'd need sensitive equipment to even detect is probably impossible. Impossible for biological life, anyway. Once you start abandoning neurons in favor of computer chips, the game changes a lot. Doing so means that now, hypothetically, you can take advantage of those longer-lived black holes. They give off just tiny trickles of power, but it takes a lot less energy to run a computer-based human and you would also be able to slow down the speed of consciousness. It doesn't matter if it takes you a trillion years to complete a sentence, when everyone else experiences time just as slowly and the outside universe is a pretty dead and boring place anyways. In part, that's what we meant about these being civilizations at the end of time, because our classic view of time starts meaning less and less. Right now, time is a pretty constant thing for us that we all experience at more or less the same rate yet time slows near black holes, so you can move in close to them to slow things down too, and if you are also tweaking your rate of thinking down to a glacial pace, you are experiencing periods of time long enough for stars to live and die like ticks on a clock. This only tells us what we can do when we run out of other power sources though, how to keep going when you run out of stars. What we explored in the original episode however was something called the Landau Limit, which demonstrates that the theoretical maximum calculations you can get out of a given amount of energy depends on the temperature. The colder it is, the more efficient your computers, if that is their limit. Half the temperature, double the calculations per joule of energy used. This massively changes the dynamic, because suddenly you are not striving to survive after the stars have burned out but intentionally hoarding your energy until after then because you can use it way more efficiently. As the universe expands, it gets cooler and cooler, and right now it's about a hundredth the temperature Earth is, meaning a computer out in the void should be able to do a hundred times the calculations for the same amount of energy as one can here on Earth. Quintillions of years in the future, when the whole universe is not even a thousandth of that temperature, you get way more processing power, or thinking and living, to put in human terms, per unit of mass or energy. Entire planets and planetary populations could be run in real time on less energy than it takes to power whatever speakers you are currently listening to me on. So a civilization might gather up all the matter that it can, storing virtually all of it until the temperature drops to whatever the minimum is that they can function on. From a practical standpoint, a given switch in a computer will need a very long time to cool back down after you use it in order to exploit that ultra-low temp computing. This actually works out fine since the biggest black holes give off power so slowly that you'd need trillions of years worth to power a light bulb for an instant. These factors coincide well if we have very durable equipment that requires minimal maintenance, since external objective time is almost meaningless in a dark post-stellar universe. Internal subjective time would be everything, and to the participants things would seem quite normal. In such a scenario, the period of time after the stars burn out is no longer some dead place where at best the last remnants of civilization are barely holding out for just a little while longer. It could be hosting mega-civilizations that would not even notice a trillion years going by in objective time, while enjoying trillions of trillions of years of subjective time. You could basically have a civilization living around a black hole a few kilometers across that dwarfs a full-blown Kardashev III galactic empire in every possible respect and that also regards the power output of a light bulb in the same way we do the entire sun. Nor would each of these black holes necessarily host an entire civilization, they might opt to run smaller communities at a higher rate of subjective time, networked with other black hole communities to form a civilization. Time lag for communications between these is not too big a deal, since it might take light a thousand years to reach your nearest neighbor, but that might seem like normal conversational speed to you and them. 
A trillion, trillion years in the future, you might be around a black hole somewhere chatting with a friend who was the same but thousands or millions of light years away, experiencing no more subjective lag between your environments than you do on the phone or in a chat room, presumably sharing some simulated environment. With subjective time slowed down so much, things like a galaxy-spanning internet finally become possible even if you are still bound by the speed of light. That was what we discussed last time, as a reminder for those who saw that, but it gives us some questions. First, how can you possibly maintain your equipment for those kind of timelines with virtually no energy, especially if there is proton decay? Second, what do you do afterwards? Is it all done then or can life go on? The answer to the second, if you can solve the first, is yes, kind of. The biggest black holes can live almost 10 to the 100th years. If you can somehow support yourself on that near-infinitesimal trickle of power, you will notice it begins to rise near the end, and you will occasionally notice your neighboring civilizations around their own, smaller black holes, surging up and eventually exploding. Near the end of life for any black hole, it will spike up to energy levels that are quite classically visible. For the last month it will be bright enough to light a whole planet, and in the end, nearly as bright as a star. That's a lot of power to run a last big party off of to say goodbye, more than enough to re-simulate our modern civilization many trillions of times, but it's also a nice chunk of energy to fuel something afterwards. That afterwards is our main interest today. Let's discuss the maintenance issue real quick. We can't build stuff that lasts more than a few years or decades nowadays, not when it comes to complex machinery, so trying to build stuff to last trillions of years with little to no maintenance sounds kind of absurd, and it certainly is in the context of our current technology, I don't want to sugarcoat this problem. Yet we can potentially benefit again from slowing down time, real time too, not just subjective time. We can slow down subjective time for thinking by just running a computer slower, various decay processes still occur at the same rate, but time slows down as you get closer and closer to a black hole, and for the very largest black holes you can get quite close before being harmed by tidal forces. This lets you slow down the rate at which decay is occurring in chemical, mechanical, electronic, or even biological systems. Of course they are only going slow from an external view. In many ways a black hole is just an implosion taking place in a slowed down region of space so that it takes eons to witness. Again, it's all about subjective time, but that's all that truly matters in a dark universe where not much is happening. However, we have another big advantage from that dark and boring universe. Damage and decay tend to be the result of external events and your machinery wouldn't experience a lot of erosion, oxidation, or decay when it exists in an empty void chilled down to a micro-Kelvin. You also have trillions of years to figure out how to build stuff for the long term, not to mention all that time to figure out alternatives like jumping into another, younger universe, or tapping vacuum energy. You might just flat out learn how to violate energy conservation or tell entropy to take a hike. Solve any of those and you can have civilizations that last a very long time. Of course one big problem with matter is that on these kind of timescales, just about everything has to be considered unstable and radioactive. Carbon-14, or radiocarbon, is very handy for radiocarbon dating because it only has a half-life of about 6,000 years. You wouldn't want to build anything out of radiocarbon that you wanted to last millions of years because it will start turning into nitrogen on you. Many other substances, while we call them stable, still have half-lives that are long, but not infinite. This is made worse if proton decay occurs, but if it doesn't, on long enough timelines, longer than even the black hole era, we do have to worry about all matter turning into iron, which we'll get to later. Overall though, you just have to worry about slowly losing matter to unavoidable losses, be it collisions or evaporation or decays. It's all fixable, but you need to be able to do that with virtually no energy, because you have virtually no power. Once again, time slows near black holes, so you might be able to dance around this issue that way too. Now we also have proton decay to consider. 
Under the standard model, protons last forever, but in some other models they do decay somewhere in between 10 to the 31 and 10 to the 36 years or longer. Either of those are near eternity compared to the stellar epoch of the universe, but it's shorter than any naturally occurring black hole would live, even a small one with a dwarf planet's mass instead of a star. This doesn't change things too much if our civilization has mastered making black holes they can actually add matter to. They wouldn't be able to use Hawking radiation from bigger ones, because they couldn't exist that long without all their matter decaying, and would be limited to just using their rotational energy and artificial, smaller black holes. They still operate like any other black hole civilization, except they'd generally be trying to prevent black holes from forming naturally or merging. We may, however, be able to make further use of decaying protons, since protons are assumed to decay into pions that turn into gamma rays, a nice source of power, and positrons. The positron is the antiparticle of the electron, and perhaps you could alter everything to run off positronium instead. Positronium is a quasi-atom composed of a positron and an electron orbiting each other instead of an electron around a proton, as in hydrogen. It is perhaps possible to build new types of molecules out of it, allowing you to continue on even with proton decay. In the normal model for the end of the universe, things keep expanding forever, with large clumps of matter bound together by gravity and the rest all carried so far away they eventually redshift over the cosmological horizon. Best guess right now is that our galaxy and its nearest neighbors will eventually merge into one big galaxy that will stay together and that's it, that is, barring artificial intervention of sorts, which we'll get to shortly. In this version of things, all matter eventually ends up in black holes, dead stars or objects too small to naturally be either. We can live around those dead stars for a very long time too but they eventually cool down into super dense super cold objects with so much gravity we'd have a hard time mining them usefully. They will have another use for us later, however, in the formation of iron stars, but that takes a very long time even compared to the black hole epoch. We can't be sure we have that much time though, and we have a theory called the Big Rip which might prevent us from even getting to the black hole epoch, let alone the iron star epoch. We don't know much about what makes the universe expand, other than it appears to be accelerating, which is why we call the force doing this dark energy, we are not illuminated yet on what it is. You will have heard about a scenario where this accelerated expansion rips the entire universe to shred in just 20 billion years. As an FYI, that period was calculated using an arbitrary round value for W, the relevant constant, of negative 1.5. We do not know what its value is, just that it's probably negative 1 or close to it, but if you plug in negative 1.5 you get about 20 billion years left, stick in negative 1 and you get infinity. There is no theory saying the universe ends in 20 billion years, it was just an example in the original paper. If it were negative 2 in the example, it would be 10 billion years. If it were negative 1.1, 100 billion. But if this theory is right, and W is not exactly equal to negative 1, the force acting to expand the universe would eventually grow strong enough to override the gravitational force existing between all galaxies, then between all stars, then strong enough to override the gravity holding stars and planets together. Taken to its conclusion, it finally reaches a level powerful enough to override the electromagnetic forces binding molecules together and eventually even nuclei themselves. However, the thing about quarks, and the strong nuclear force that binds them together, is that when you pull on two quarks to rip them apart, you have to exert so much energy to do that that you actually end up spawning two new pairs of quarks, so you get this huge new outpoint of new matter everywhere. It's a bit of a hydra thing, slice up a quark pair and get two more. That's also one way to convert energy into matter. The theory gets a bit more uncertain at that point since it operates under general relativity, which is very iffy at the atomic scale, and of course our understanding of dark energy is not terribly precise or ironclad either. Right now it's a bit of a black box. We know what it does but not how it works or where it comes from. 
and we can't rule out that a better understanding of it might open a new energy source for us, see the Dark Energy episode for more discussion of it. Regardless of what happens when you get to the Atomic Unbinding stage, nothing would be around to witness it so it wouldn't matter to you. If your scientists determine that it is the correct theory, you then figure out the actual timeline you have left and ration resources accordingly. If you've got 20 billion years, you really have no reason to conserve anything. I've heard folks suggest you can make a very large black hole and tuck your civilization inside it for protection, but I've also heard the Big Rip takes out black holes too. I would say a cosmologist could provide a better answer, but we have no proper theory for quantum gravity, so it's probably a guessing game right now anyway. That end expansion is very fast too so you wouldn't duck inside a black hole to buy a little more time or anything. Assuming the Big Rip isn't the case though, civilizations looking at real long-term solutions probably want to conserve matter and energy as much as they can, and probably hoard it from wherever they can. It stands to reason that if you are planning to keep your civilization around as long as you can, you will start hoarding matter so that it doesn't get burnt up uselessly in stars or fall into black holes bigger than you want or get ejected out of the galaxy. This is one of the reasons we say in the Dyson Dilemma that civilizations that don't want to expand their numbers might seem to expand anyway, as they journey outwards not to colonize other solar systems but to stockpile their matter instead, like squirrels hoarding nuts because winter is coming. Big stars do make valuable heavy elements, but supernovae are not efficient methods for that, and odds are civilizations that want more of those would prefer to use a giant particle accelerator instead, as we discussed in last week's Dyson Spheres episode. I also mentioned there that it is possible to move planets or stars, however it is also possible to move galaxies. In all of these cases, the method is not high-tech, just very big. The Great Wall or Pyramids were huge tasks, but hardly high-tech. While technology can possibly make it much easier to do, or offer you other methods, fundamentally it is not complicated, just an application of the maxim, if brute force isn't working, you're not using enough of it. If you don't mind waiting a billion years, you can place a ton of thin mirrors near a star and have them bounce the light in one direction, accelerating them up to quite high speeds as explained in the Shikadov's Thruster episode. You can accelerate that process by using methods we discussed in Star Lifting to spew out increased amounts of solar wind, like a rocket engine flame. Do this to a galaxy's worth of stars and their own gravity will bring that galaxy along. We will discuss this more in the future, but the summary form is that you are not limited to your galaxy's resources alone or even to those of the dozen or so near enough not to be pulled apart from us by an expanding universe. I am frequently asked how far outwards I think we could ever hope to colonize, and the answer is it depends on how fast your ships can go. You have probably heard of Hubble's constant, usually measured at about 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. I try to avoid using parsecs on the channel so it's about 20 kilometers per second per mega light year or 2 centimeters per second per light year, whichever you find easier. That's how fast something is traveling away from us, from all the space emerging from every point in between us and it as the universe expands, so a billion light years away would be 20,000 kilometers per second, which is about 7% of light speed. You need a ship that can go at least that fast to reach a galaxy that far, far away. I generally place this as the practical point of expansion since I figure you will eventually run into someone else who would appreciate your not setting up shop in their galaxy, even if they don't exist yet. Leave now on a billion light year journey and when you arrive, a planet that was just forming when you left might be the capital of an interstellar empire. And while intergalactic warfare is at least vaguely plausible in an OFTL universe, inter-supercluster warfare really is not. You could also get a galaxy to move at this speed back towards you, but probably not much faster, so the million or so nearest galaxies closer than about a billion light years from us is probably all the mass available to a civilization. We'll go with the rounded value of 10 to the 48 kilograms, keep that in mind for later, but that's more or less your upper limit, and it could be steered into a pretty compact value not much larger than our galaxy. 
any tighter than that and the combined mass would form a galaxy-sized black hole. Some of that matter, however much you hoarded, would be acting as fuel. Indeed, probably almost all of it would, eventually, but we can assume a lot of it will be used for making computers and memory. The processing power permitted under classical computing when temperature is your true upper limit and you've got solar systems worth of mass to build your computers out of is mind-boggling. But we have some options that might let us squeeze even more calculations or simulations out of a small amount of energy. We talked about quantum computing earlier this year and tried to dispel some of the myths about it which elevate it beyond a very powerful tool into almost magical status and at some point we'll need to do the same for time crystals. But, unsurprisingly, a lot of folks have wondered if these options let you blow past even the titanic processors allowed under classic computing or potentially do entropy-free calculation, reversible computing. Last time, we discussed how Landauer's limit on conventional computing is based on temperature. It is a hard physical limit that tells us that no matter how much we improve computing, we can't beat that not with conventional computing at least. As I said in the quantum computing episode, we never want to regard that technology as a magic wand, and it is way too new for us to discuss it reliably. That's even more true for reversible computing, specifically physically reversible or isentropic computing, where you could do all your calculations essentially energy-free by undoing the process afterwards. This is usually thought to be impossible and actually where Landauer's principle derives from, but we're not sure it actually is physically impossible, there are some reasons to think otherwise, and trillions of years is a long time to figure out how to do it or get close to it. If that turned out to be possible though, it turns out we have another limit of a different kind that controls the speed we can reverse calculations at. This derives from the Margolo Levantine Theorem that shows that even reversible computing and quantum computing are fundamentally limited to no more than 6 times 10 to 33 operations per second per joule. The more physics savvy of you might have just twitched, yes that was seconds per joule not joules per second. It is saying that, if you can keep using the same energy to run computations constantly, that this is the maximum speed you can run them at. Converting that into matter at about 10 to the 17 joules per kilogram and dividing by our usual assumption of about 10 to the 16th hertz of processing to emulate a human brain, we get 6 times 10 to the 34 people being simulated per kilogram of matter, which was about the same as what we got from a full-blown solar system spanning Matrioska brain and MB and which would conveniently fit in your pocket rather than an entire solar system. If you saw the episode on Matrioska brains, you might recall that it could hoard more emulated minds than an entire K3 civilization could. As a reminder, a K3 civilization is one that hasn't just populated every solar system in the galaxy, but also turned them all into Dyson spheres. Now since this presumably does not need energy to run on, or rather doesn't expend any, our 1 kilogram pocket MB could just sit there emulating billions of trillions of trillions of humans forever, enough to normally populate an entire supercluster of galaxies converted into Dyson Swarms. One eternal engine of thought for 1 kilogram of mass energy. Earlier, I mentioned we could possibly get our hands on as much as a supercluster of mass, 10 to the 48th kilograms, a trillion, 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 trillion kilograms. At this sort of scale, numbers start feeling a bit meaningless, but you'd be talking about a potential real-time population of 10 to the 83 people. More if you either run them slower or can get that proxy figure per person down. That is more people than there are atoms in the observable universe. You can add on 5 more orders of magnitude if you want to assume the entire observable universe was converted, not just the matter in the nearest billion light years, or knock 5 or 6 off if you want to limit it to the galaxy. We don't know that such a thing is possible, but that is the hard limit for that in much the same way Landauer's limit is way beyond what we can do now with computers it represents a hard limit on what we can do conventionally. 
I get asked about reversible and quantum computing a lot after the original episode, so I wanted to address that option. We do have to wonder what such a computer would be used for, the obvious being to keep running simulations of people, digital consciousnesses, though an alternative is to devote all that processing power to trying to learn how to break the laws of thermodynamics and reverse entropy, a very important question for any civilization that wants to live forever, and the last question you'll probably be asking if you want to see the other side of eternity. Keeping to the more classic views of computing and the universe though, we still have options for surviving the Black Hole Epoch. Once those all die, and basically explode, it's always good to remember that's how that goes down, all the universe is a frozen, desolate void of gas at near vacuum levels and a few leftover dead stars or planets. If you were some civilization that spent the last 10 to the 100th years living around a leftover galactic core black hole, and the last trillion or so of it living around the much smaller and more energetic one it became, storing up that energy, you would have noticed the occasional object drifting around that was just a bit warmer than the background temperature of the Universe. You'll know that these used to be neutron stars or white dwarfs that long since cooled off, but haven't cooled off completely. You recognize one as Good Old Soul, our home star, long since turned Red Giant, then White Dwarf, and finally Black Dwarf. Nobody ever disassembled it or shoved it into a black hole for fuel because it was our home. It gave us life back at the dawn of time, and we will return to it now, at the end of time, to let it give us life once more. The reason it is just the barest degree warmer than the universe around it is that inside, incredibly slowly even compared to black hole timelines, particles are slowly transmuting into ion and releasing a little energy when they do this. Ion is the last stopover point for matter, heavier matter eventually decays into it and lighter matter fuses up into it. This happens super fast in big stars, but here in our dead sun it occurs over time periods of 10 to the 1500 years, and every time such a transformation occurs, a little energy is released. How a civilization would possibly tap such tiny amounts of power, let alone maintain their equipment while doing this, is beyond me. Even doing it for the Hawking radiation of a normal solar mass black hole pushes plausibility. Yet, at least on paper, under known physics, it is conceivable. If they can somehow gain power out of this tiny Earth-sized remnant, and operate computers off it, they can keep going. They can continue to exist on this ion star for timelines that look at the whole prior universe, even the black hole epoch, as so much less than an eye blink. And we're still not done yet. Once this white dwarf turned black dwarf slowly mutates into a pure ion star, it will not have reached its lowest energy level. That ion star will eventually collapse into a neutron star, at an estimated timeline of 10 to the 10 to the 76 years, coincidentally almost the same as the 10 to the 10 to the 77 possible unique states for the Universe or total alternate universes, that we discussed in Infinite Improbability Issues. A very great deal of energy will be released when that collapse from Ion Star to Neutron Star occurs. This means even more lifetime for those there, if they have somehow survived that long. Alternatively, Ion Stars might turn into black holes even sooner, a mere 10 to the 10 to the 26 years, and you restart yourself. That black hole that forms, being of less than one solar mass, will once more give off only a tiny trickle of energy, but it would seem like a banquet feast compared to what you were used to back in the black hole epoch. Finally though, it will end, after another neo-eternal golden age. It slowly rises in power until it gives off its last gas, shining nearly as brightly as the stars that disappeared so long ago. And then that is essentially it. If you haven't figured out how to keep going in the face of entropy by now, it is too late. But you will get that final second black hole epoch, or neutron star epoch, depending on how the physics of that works out. And yet, it is not necessarily the end of intelligence, even if it is the end of civilization. 
If matter is required to store information, and you've been accumulating so much of it, you've probably also been discarding extra bits to keep going a while longer. If the sun went out, you could stay alive a while longer by tossing your furniture and books into the fireplace, and while you might not be able to bring yourself to toss your favorite book into the fire to buy a few more minutes, all sorts of old manuals and reference books might find themselves in there. Odds are pretty good such civilizations would do the same, maybe trading every memory for a little more time, maybe just old tax returns and astronomical tables sacrificed to live a while longer. In the end, they go, sooner rather than later if they want to keep a lot, but they can keep some in reserve almost to the end, because the power levels will rise for a black hole near the end, or for the class of an iron star to a neutron star. Either way, this is when time, as any meaningful measure, has truly come to an end. Eternity has come and gone and taken with it any civilizations and their records, but again, not necessarily intelligence. We call it the heat death of the universe even though it is terribly cold because everything is in thermal equilibrium, there is no longer any source for energy. Entropy and the laws of thermodynamics have finally closed the book on things. Yet inside that random chaos it is possible for occasional bits of order to emerge. If I take a deck of cards and put it in order, then shuffle it, it becomes disordered, more and more every time I shuffle it, but if I do that enough times, it will return to its original state. It could happen at any time, but on average, for a 52 card deck, it should take approximately 52 factorial shuffles, or 52 times 51 times 50 times 49, etc., all the way down to 1. In this case, if I shuffled that deck once every second, I should expect to reset it in about 10 to the 60th years. This may seem an impossibly long time period, but on the timelines we've been looking at today, that's actually rather modest. Were I to use only one suit of cards, just 13 cards, in order from ace to king, that would be more like 200 years, something which you might see in your own lifetime of shuffling. Likewise, if I used a larger deck, it would take far longer. Back in Ludwig Boltzmann's day, we knew about entropy, but thought the universe was steady state. In a closed system like that, no matter how big it is, just like shuffling a deck of enormous cards, Eventually, your particles all reset, and will reset to something close enough far sooner. When all this chaos and random action, even processes which normally build up entropy, become effectively reversible, so long as there is a finite chance of them occurring. And in the Infinite Improbabilities episode, we discussed all the weird things that can happen when we begin giving incredibly tiny yet still finite odds near infinite time or space to walk in. One of those weird things is the Boltzmann Brain, that even in a universe reduced to total entropy, out of that chaos will emerge a random pattern of matter that is a thinking creature. Everything is bumpy around chaotically and just happens to create a random pattern that is, for instance, a big sentient supercomputer with a nice nuclear reactor attached to it to run it until the components or fuel decays. Perhaps even a nice habitat with plants inside it, with a person to eat them, a little Eden if you will. After eternity, in this frigid, random soup, these minds could just keep popping up. We do not live in a steady state universe, ours is expanding, so we are pretty much guaranteed no total resets of entropy, but Boltzmann brains can exist and indeed can come to be in other universes where the physical constants might have values that normally preclude life, or even simple chemistry, from occurring. Indeed in some universes they'd probably be the only kind of life that could exist. Over an infinite period of time, anything that can happen, will happen including a stable and long-lasting Boltzmann brain, which might sit around contemplating ways to deal with entropy. Such an entity would not remember us though, it would not know or remember that there ever was a universe beyond the frozen sea of chaos all around it, but it would be alive and thinking. And since, if one could exist, there is an even smaller chance two could exist near each other in time or space, or three or more, 
we do have a chance for a civilization after the end of time. And you only need a chance. This is as far as we go looking into the future, so while we might do some more episodes on civilizations at the end of time, there'll have to be prequels, not sequels. Time can't really be said to have an end, and in a lot of ways we aren't talking about the end of time, but our general fight against entropy itself. It's a long drawn out war, with a lot of battles along the way, even before the death of our own son, which as we've seen in this series, is more of a prologue than epilogue to civilization. I mentioned near the beginning that the episode was dedicated to Asmov and his short story The Last Question, which is focused on that theme and is generally voted his best short story. It starts off in modern times and rolls all the way on to the end of things, charting Asmo's vision for the future of humanity. It's been adapted a number of times, including a performance by Leonard Nimoy, and has also shown up in five or six Asmov short story anthologies. Even 60 years later, the story manages to talk about computers and the future in surprisingly accurate ways, and, where it misses the boat, it highlights how new we are to this technology and how much room to improve it we have in the very long time we have before the stars start going dark. As the channel approached 100,000 subscribers, we had a lot of comments and jokes about how we might get a sponsor, and as some of you might recall, I said I probably wouldn't accept one unless it came from someone like Maxwell House, Starbucks, or Audible. I am a very big audiobook addict and have been since I was a kid, and I'm usually listening to one when writing or editing these episodes. As it turns out, Audible approached me a couple weeks back and offered a sponsorship, essentially on the grounds that we already talk about science fiction novels a lot anyway, so it was a pretty natural fit, and as a longtime customer of theirs, I'm glad to welcome them on board as a sponsor. I had already written this draft of this script and talked about the last question in it, so starting off by recommending my favorite short story by my namesake, Isaac Asimov, seemed very appropriate. That short story is available on Audible by itself, or in the anthology Robot Dreams, and you can pick up a free copy today. Just use my link, audible.com slash Isaac, or click on the link in the description below to get a free audiobook and a 30-day trial. That's audible.com slash I-S-A-A-C. I'm certain you will enjoy that story, but if not, you can swap it out for free for any other book at any time and it's yours to keep whether you stay subscribed to Audible or not. Next week, we will be returning to the Fermi Paradox Great Filter series to look at possible conditions that might make life on Earth-like planets a lot less likely than we tend to think, in Rare Earth. The week after that, we will take a look at the concept of force fields and see if there are any realistic options for that under known science as well as discuss some underexplored uses and applications for such technology, if you've got it. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week. Bye.